Hello and welcome. It's our Christmas Confessions podcast. Uh, this week's concise collection of terrible tales include... Here we go with our alliteration sequence. A couple's curry coup, a sensational swallowing Santa, a cheeky chip chomp, a patrolling policeman's prank, and as an added bonus, a dire dessert disaster. Nicely done. Nine out of ten. Who will you forgive? All this week we have Christmas confessions, and at this time of year it's very nice to unburden yourself of something that's been troubling you maybe all your life. Or maybe... why, why are you pointing at me? Oh. I, I have no need to unburden myself to you or anyone. Really. This is from... It's just from Sally. It's not me, I promise you. Dear Father Simon, in the collective festive gathering, on listening to your show over the last two years, I have been determined to admonish my Christmas confession this year and ask for absolution for a most wicked deceit committed some 20 years ago. Picture the scene and cast your own minds back to your first love-struck Christmas, which had the added bonus of taking place in your own first home. That was me and my lovely man, James. We had moved into our first home together some six months earlier. It was a rambling old place with an overgrown and overly large garden. This will be a most important factor later on in the story. A new Siberian husky puppy by the name of Sarah completed our family picture prior to the patter of tiny feet. Come September, both sets of in-laws had sown the seeds of where we, would, where we should be spending Christmas Day. Despite our subtle hints that as we were in our first new home, we would like to spend the day on our own. Our temporary uh, acquired selective deafness at our family's subtle hints failed to rectify the matter until a day in November when, over Sunday lunch, a predictable conversation regarding Christmas arose. I remember getting twitchy and attempting to change the conversation to the lovely colours of the trees when my husband suddenly announced, actually, we're going out to lunch on Christmas Day. The atmosphere physically changed and I almost choked on my honey-roasted parsnip. This was news to me. Where to, was my father-in-law's domineering response. Uh, to a restaurant, replied my husband. Oh, how lovely. Well, we'll all come too, was the collective response. At this point, I thought my husband would concede defeat, but no. To my horror, he described a local Indian takeaway where, he'd, where we had once ordered a substandard chicken ticket and Rogan Josh and explained that the new owners were trying their hand at restaurant food for one day only. It was Christmas Day. My parents were gutted. James's parents were horrified. Both couples accepted our decision rather glumly, slightly confused that we were choosing to eat out on such a glorious family day. For the rest of the month and throughout December, we had tears and protests, but we both held our resolve to be alone on Christmas Day. Our guilt became overwhelming with each passing day. On Christmas Eve, we headed for our nearest delicatessen and local posh supermarket and rammed our fridge with every conceivable edible delight. Christmas Day was frosty and clear. Sarah was let out for her daily ablutions and we settled down to watch the telly with the obligatory glass of champagne or two. An hour or two passed and we realised that Sarah was nowhere to be found. We searched the garden and called her name but no response. James, still in his new slippers, went out only to slip on the ice and sprain his ankle. In standing up, he fell over a brick and slipped a disc. In hobbling back to the house, he slipped a third time, bumped his head and was unconscious for about five dear minutes. Dear. At this point, the phone rang and my mum was ringing to wish us a tearful happy Christmas. My response was equally as teary in explaining James's unfortunate series of events with the missing mutt and the fact that he was now laid up on the sofa. My guilt knew no bounds when my lovely parents offered to come round and look for the dog whilst we went out for our Indian meal. No amount of protest would pacify them and 20 minutes later they turned up in their walking gear ready to look for our dog, insisting that we get ready for our splendid Christmas meal. Consequently, we were duty-bound to get dressed up in our splendour and head out for our fake meal. The reality of it was that we spent our first Christmas together sitting in a car park a mile away from home, sharing a packet of digestives racked with guilt and pain from the injuries sustained. A call confirmed the dog had been found alive and well, and would it be OK to help themselves to a sandwich? They'd no doubt found the fit-to-bursting fit fridge filled with all our excessive food. My guilt was relentless and to this day remains so. In fact, it taps me on the shoulder each Christmas some 20 years later. As a consequence, we have never repeated the web of lies and year on year we play the dutiful hosts to both sets of parents. So, Father Simon, I beg 
the collective's forgiveness on such a blatantly cruel scam. We were young and foolish and had no thought for anyone else. We offered my parents some of the smoked salmon and caviar that we could no longer face and promised to drive over later that evening. Throughout the afternoon, we sat riddled by our guilt and physically choking on our platter of rich food. The incident was never mentioned again, and I often wonder if our families ever realised what lengths we'd gone to be on our own for our first Christmas. They may have knowingly added to our misery by showing up to carry out the search for the dog, knowing it was a certain passport to future family gatherings. Well, it worked. It's another sitcom sketch. That's what this is from Sally. They wanted to be on their own. The lovebirds wanted to be on their own. And a few bumps and bruises later, and a miserable first Christmas lunch of chocolate digestive... I don't even know it was chocolate, actually. Just digestives in the car. Entirely on their own. What say you, sister? It's a difficult one, this, because, um, you know, who of us can't say that they would, on occasion, have preferred to spend Christmas away from the extended family? Is that what you're saying? Uh, Well, maybe it has occurred to me that it'd be quite nice just to spend it, you know, with my loved one, my husband. Um, And not your your loving, supportive family. No, well, I mean, you know, in the early days it would have been nice, but we always did actually sacrifice, you know, those lovely days and spend it with our family. And uh, and you've resented it ever since? I know, I haven't. I think that the pain it would have caused to them would not have been worth it. So I think Christmas is a time for family, and I think there was some karmic revenge going on here, um, which is why James um, hurt himself so badly and the dog disappeared. So I think um, that you were being punished, Sally, for that, and I think you know that because you felt quite guilty. So I think because you've been punished already, I'm going to forgive you. Mother's up. See, I don't think there's anything wrong. I don't really think there's anything to forgive here. I think it's perfectly fine to say, for one Christmas, for our first Christmas, we want to be on our own. And if they didn't want to offend the family. I could understand why they made a story up. I completely understand that. I mean, I I think it's unfortunate that he broke his ankle or whatever it was he did. And yeah, there was a little bit of karma in that, but nothing wrong with wanting that. I mean, I understand that the family thing is, is sacrosanct to some people. It isn't necessary to me. So you are totally forgiven. Thanks, Mother. What do you have, Brother Matthew? How badly do you want to miss out on on a meal with your in-laws that you prepared to go and have digestives and not come clean? Decide, no, 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 we're going to go out, we're going to go along with this pretense and sit in a car for half an hour eating a pack of di- digestives. Pretty desperate stuff. And also, clearly the in-laws will have rumbled them because they'll have looked in the, in the fridge, seen this huge amount of food there and realised, aha, they're not actually going out to the, to the curry house at all. They're, they're going to eat here. So... Frankly, I'm with them because they're the ones who've kept quiet about this and not decided to make them feel guilty all this time. So I'm going to say not forgiven. And tonight's tale from Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Dear Father Simon and the revered Christmas angels. That's you guys. At this season of Goodwill, I feel it is time to confess to an unfortunate occurrence that took place some 30 years to go. As I, um, tonight's tale is about someone who decided to, as you're about to hear, decided to dress up uh, and pretend to be Father Christmas. OK, just... Just giving us warning of that, are you? Yeah, just yep. say. So. Well, I, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really excited. Right. In those days, I was a member... The more sensitive members of our community will have understood my reference. In those days, I was a member of our local round table. Every Christmas, to raise money for local charities, we used to build a Christmas float on the back of our lorry and tour the local area, playing carols loudly as we went. One of us would dress up as Santa Claus and ride in the rickety wooden sleigh that we built on the back of the lorry, waving cheerily to all the children whose parents had been trying to put them to bed. The rest of our crew would be knocking on doors and collecting donations. Generally, we were enthusiastically received and people were very generous, although there were a couple of areas where the house lights used to go off ahead of us in a sort of electrical Mexican wave and then go on again as we left the street. Those particular residents vainly thought that we might not knock on their door and ask for a donation if the house was in darkness. This is is like trick or treat all over again, isn't it? (laughs) On the particular evening in question, it was my turn to be Santa. I put on the robes, donned the luxuriant false beard, climbed aboard my diesel-powered sleigh and off we set. Apart from the fact that it was freezing cold on top of the lorry, I was quite enjoying myself, waving vigorously at all the passers-by and ho-ho-hoing from time to time as I got into the spirit of things. Now, I've already mentioned that most people were very generous with their donations. Very occasionally, some of us were offered a drink as well, which, of course, it would have been churlish to refuse, apart from the driver, of course. On this particular evening... 
There was an exceptionally nice chap who not only offered us a drink of sherry, but also a plate of freshly baked mince pies. As he handed me my mince pie, he whispered to me, Would you mind waiting until you get up the road before you have yours? I don't want the kids to see you lift your beard and see that you're just pretending to be Santa. Of course, I replied, thank you very much indeed and very Merry Christmas to you all. Well, to be honest, I was starving and pretty darn cold as well. And the pie smelled absolutely delicious, but I had given my word. And I waited hungrily until we got some distance away to a quieter area of that particular village. I furtively lifted my beard a little way, opened my mouth and took an enormous bite from that wonderful pie. I swallowed gratefully and then I swallowed again. And then I had to swallow again. Something was wrong, very seriously wrong. Something very odd indeed was catching in my throat and it wasn't a normal ingredient of any mince pie that I'd ever eaten. I swallowed, or I, I tried to swallow and choked a bit yet again, and it was only then that I realised that I'd not only swallowed a substantial mouthful of pie, but I'd swallowed a significant part of my luxuriant false beard as well. Oh that high artificial fibre diet was bad enough in itself. What was far, far worse was that part of the beard that was now well on its way towards my stomach was still attached at its other end <laughs> to the rest of the Christmas beard that enveloped my face. Well, what was I to do? I couldn't call out to my colleagues, and they were well up the road knocking on the next lot of doors anyway, so apart from cough and splutter, I wasn't sure how to carry on. I did the only thing that I could, and I pulled steadily and determinedly oh, at the no. top end of the beard and, shall we say, regurgitated the sodden mess that formed the rest of it. Somehow I managed to retain the rest of the pie that I'd swallowed. I quickly looked around, unusually, and to my immense relief, no families at all were on the pavement waving to me at that particular point. Children had not been traumatised by the unfortunate sight of a struggling, regurgitating Santa. Not a soul appeared to have witnessed my plight. The only evidence of my mishap was the damp, smelly and maybe slightly differently textured beard. So we carried on on our way, me entertaining the kids, eyes still watering somewhat, my colleagues collecting, and by the end of the evening, the beard had pretty much dried out, albeit with a slightly odd permanent wave, about a third of the way through it. We got back to our workplace where the lorry was stored, locked, and everything was... Uh, was fine, and we made our separate ways home, some rather more unsteadily than others, I have to report. Now, for some reason that escapes me, I neglected to tell the rest of the crew that I'd nearly died swallowing my beard. <clears throat> so my Santa costume had got locked, OK? It was complete with the offending and now offensive beard, locked in the cab of the lorry, and I never said another word. However, I ask forgiveness for this. Because I inflicted that dreadful beard on my colleagues, whose duty it was to act as Santa on the following nights and several Saturdays into the town centre, and who had unwittingly to wear something that had always spent time not just on me, but actually had spent some time inside me as well. The unusual pigment was, while being entirely natural and biodegradable, I'm afraid to say an unpleasant greeny brown oh, and seemed yeah. to be permanent. Well, we hadn't had a regurgitated beard tail, and so obviously it went straight in there, and he clearly tried to do the right thing in swallowing the mince pie, and he had to pull the beard up from his stomach and then just didn't... He should have wiped it and washed this it. This must be an occupational hazard for, for people who dress up as Santa in the festive season. And people point. with beards, actually. I mean, do people swallow their beards ever when they're real beards? Well, if it's, it's a, a... If it's, it's a, a, long. If it's a beard that's yeah. like a foot It might, and a it might half. happen quite often, one would have thought. If only we'd done this, we could have mentioned this to Chris when he had the Archbishop of Canterbury in this morning. Well, and asked him. And asked him whether yeah, he'd ever swallowed his beard. Yeah, that would have been a good use of time. <laughs> uh, yes. Good point. I think... Very holy. I think, um... I think... Think, what do I think? Well, his the, his successors in this in the dressing up as Santa department could have just bought a new beard. That's what I think. Um, even though it's a bit disgusting. Hey, Santa, your beard. beard's all green. Yeah, a bit disgusting, but not too awful because you know it's not that hard to get a beard. Or he could have just been Santa without a beard. So I think he suffered enough having uh, nearly choked to death on this revolting beard. Um, so I'm going to forgive you, Johnny. Mother Superior. Well, have you ever had a beard? Matt, have you ever had a beard? No, no not, not a long beard. Not, not a beard at all. No. Really? OK. Well, I'd, Have you? Uh, yes, I have to shave on a regular basis. Um, but I, what I'm thinking is that the Santa didn't frighten any of the children, did he? No, which no, is, no. Which is no, the no main sorry, thing. Yeah. And that would, have been, that would have been a problem if, if he'd have... Um, if he'd it's, have only skipped. it's only a pretend It's Santa. only a pretend The real Santa. Santa wouldn't do that. And so that's why he had a pretend thing. But, um, and he didn't harm himself at all. So I do forgive you, but only 
just. We haven't had a regurgitated confession before, but anyway, what do you think? No, we, we should we should definitely have more of those. Um, uh, th- the reason why this is great is because his friends would the next night have to be wearing this beard with yes. the green brown st- stain on it, and uh, all the kiddies are going to be going, "Why does Father Christmas smell a bit odd?" Um, and why has he got? He's, no, he's never got a green and brown beard on any of the I've pictures we've that got. Picture. I've, uh, no, is it a nicotine stain? Kept that what? under wraps. Um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna forgive. Simon, could we have a picture of you in your Twansy, please? Matt in Stourbridge, uh, and the photograph of it's me and Sal who've got the onesies. Apologies to Matt and Rebecca because they are onesie less. Right. I think I'll live. Okay, you can borrow mine if you like. Really? Yes. No, uh, anyway, it's up on the, it's up on our uh, Facebook page. Oh right, okay. Here's tonight's tale. I'm not actually as big as I look in it, to be honest. It's just extra large. I think, I think, so I think people know. will realise that we're slightly <laughs> just puffed up. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in your own line there. So this comes from the Bad Samaritan. Thank you, Bad Samaritan, for tonight's seasonal story. Simon and the Ever Caring Collective. My confession takes me back to a Christmas I have tried to forget for many years. The first Friday of every month is Boys' Night, whereupon a group of old university friends gather for a general knees-up in Leeds. Our get-togethers are usually quite laid-back affairs, but at Christmas we always ramp it up a notch. I live just two stops north of Leeds, which makes it quite easy for me to get home. The greatest challenge I have nowadays is staying awake for the 22-minute journey home and not, as has happened three times to date, waking up at the end of the line on an empty train and a grinning guard pointing towards the taxi rank. The technique I've adopted to avoid this is to buy a burger and chips in the train station, which not only serves to satisfy my hunger at that time of night, but I've found it takes me just 22 minutes to eat, thus ensuring I remain awake until my stop. Our festive boys' night out was arranged and we all met in the middle of Leeds. In an act of pure hedonism, we even met an hour earlier than normal. Rock and roll, huh? And a thoroughly enjoyable time was had by all. Such was the enjoyment that I lost all track of time. Hey, what time's your train, as we say in Leeds? Uh, asked one of my friends. Not until 11.15, I said. Well, it's five past now, came the reply. You better get a move on. Now, to miss my train was not an option. I exited the pub in a blind panic to the sound of raucous laughter and set off across Leeds like Usain Bolt. I entered Leeds station and, gazing up at the clock, I realised I only had two minutes to get on my train. It was just doable. As I jogged through the station, I could see the burger bar ahead shining like the star above the little stable in Bethlehem. Ooh, a burger would be nice, I thought. A burger and chips would be very nice. I briefly considered the possibilities of getting some grub before the train, but a dim flicker of middle-aged common sense told me that it was impossible. So I leapt onto the busy train and sat in the last available seat in my carriage. A few more revellers jumped on, but within seconds the doors shut and we were off. I congratulated myself on having made it. As I set about the task of staying awake for the next 22 minutes, I noticed a chap slouching next to me. I turned to give a cursory hello, only to find the poor bloke was fast asleep with his hat pulled down over his face. Been there, mate, I thought with a sympathetic smile. It was then that I noticed it. A beautiful, pristine, regal burger beside a haystack of hot golden French fries laid out like a king's banquet across the lap of the sleeping man. I'll have one if you do, said a female voice behind me. I I turned to see a girl and her boyfriend stood in the aisle grinning at the sleeping man and the burger. That's going on the floor, said the boyfriend, meaning the burger. I I looked back at the fries. They did look fantastic. I looked back at the girl. It also looked fantastic. And after a brief moment of hesitation, I reached out and plucked a couple of fries from the haystack and crammed them into my mouth. The hot combination of cooking oil, salt and just the faintest hint of potato was pure ambrosia to my tongue. The girl reached across and took a couple herself and ate them. We gave each other a shed. Ooh, at the taste sensation. <laughs> a what? Well, it was slightly too camp. That bit. I don't think she went, oh, oh, oh chips. <laughs> That's like Frankie Howard. Oh, I don't know. How, I don't know who says ooh. I don't know how you're supposed to say it in a chippy way. At this point, I really wish I had simply sat back and settled for just the four stolen chips on my conscience. But I didn't sit back. I took two more and then three more. No one was looking and pure greed had momentarily consumed me. Then it got a whole lot worse. Much worse. In a moment of pure madness, I picked up the burger and took an enormous bite. It tasted so good. I had another and then another. I could hardly now put a, a half-eaten burger back, could I? What was I to do? I quickly reasoned with no help whatsoever from my moral compass. 
that there was nothing else for it, I'd have to eat the whole thing. So I hastily took more bites and crammed another fistful of fries into my mouth. All pleasure derived from the food was quickly eclipsed by the rising panic about what I was doing. I was about two-thirds of the way through the meal when there was a very sudden and loud burp and then grunt next to me. I completely froze. The remainder of the chips on this guy's lap tumbled to the floor. Clutching the remnants of the burger, I sat wide-eyed and motionless. The man's head lifted. He hooked a thumb under the bottom of his hat, lifted it sufficiently that he got one sleepy eye open. After what felt like an eternity, I watched as the man's eye ever so slowly began to abandon its attempt to focus. It very gently closed once more with another grunt and another burp. The hat was tugged down again and the man slumped back against the window. I let out a small whimpering breath and just managed to suppress the urge to burst into tears. You had had a lot to drink. Very soon all that was left of the meal with a scattering of chips on the floor, what I was wearing down my jacket. Finally, the platform appeared alongside and leaving the man just as I'd found him, I jumped from the train with a wave at the girl and the boy and I scuttled off into the dark of the night. In my defence, there is no doubt that the burger and chips was never going to be eaten, but I know what I did was wrong. So I asked forgiveness from the poor chap whose food I consumed, who I let go on to the end of the rail without waking up, so he almost certainly missed his stop. I humbly await your wise words. From the Bad Samaritan. Well, it's a seasonal tale. I mean, it's just a, it's just a tale of beer plus chips, really. Which is Matt's kind of tale. We'll get to Matt in just a moment. What do you say? Seasonal well, that last bit, I mean, the, the sting in the tale of that was he also missed his stop and the guy knew. He didn't wake him up because he didn't want him to well, find out he'd it, eaten yeah. his burger. That's his guess that, that he is, just let that's him That's even more shocking. I mean, I think it's pretty shocking that he ate his stuff anyway. Never mind the man was asleep and he wasn't going to eat it. That's not the point. And he it kind of thought... It would have been cold. He kind of knew. I mean, he wouldn't have done it if the boy and girl hadn't been involved as well, you know, but he's trying to use that as a sort of moral blanket to say he's not responsible. I think, of course, he's responsible, and I, I, I wonder what everyone else in the train must have been thinking as they watched this, these three people eating this poor man's meal. So, no, I think it's terrible for that, and also for the fact that he let him miss his stop. You're not forgiven, Mother Superior. Well, first of all, I do forgive you um, because I th- what I don't forgive. I mean, I think it was a big risk eating somebody else's food. You don't know where it had been. You don't know what it had been in contact with. And I understand he was drunk and perhaps didn't know what he was doing. But I think it was very risky on your behalf to eat something where you didn't know where it had come from or even what was in it. It could have been a horse burger or a kangaroo burger or some burger that you really didn't want to eat. But he you might know, not have washed his hands. He might not exactly. Well, he might not have washed his hands and all sorts of things. Carry on. Um, so I do forgive you, but you know, you just got to be a bit more careful. It's a little bit of a health warning there from Mother Superior. She's always got your interests at heart. Yes, um, I, I think there's a, a, an ethical difference between nicking his fries, which he's not going to notice, and nicking his burger, which he clearly is going to notice. In a because, court of law, this is yes, a very fine. Point. I think I think in a court of law, it would there would be a difference between the between the two of them. So I, I'm, I'm with him when he's nicking the fries because I'd have done that. Um, and so yeah, let, let he is without sin, you know, cast the first. You're fry. always quoting scripture. Um, it's always, unbelievable. Yes. Uh, so I'd have I'd have been with him on the fries. It's when he takes the burger that I think mm, not sure. But then when he leaves leaves him on the train. Leaves him on the train, so not only has he missed his stop, and there's, by the way, no more trains, he's not even got a burger and fries to take him home that night. So, no, you're not forgiven. See, on that theory, on that basis, if you break into a bank, you can help yourself to the coins, but you can't have the You notes. see, that's where the legal problem falls down for me, Yeah, really. But but I think there is, a, uh, there is a difference between taking the burger and taking the fries. What about all the fries? If it had been all the fries, that would have been... Um, <laughs> yes. OK, well, no, but then yeah. they'd have fallen out anyway. So, yeah. so no, yes, I... You can have all the fries, just don't have the burger. There is one more Christmas confession which has uh, been added to our uh, Confessions podcast, which will be available from uh, tomorrow. It's an extra seasonal bonus, so you get five on the podcast. Four are going to be broadcast. It's not particularly risque or, uh, or dodgy, it's just that we had a good one and we wanted to include it, uh, so that's where you're going to find it. Here's the last one, though, for now, and it comes from Dick. Thank you, Dick, Father Simon and the Christmas Collective. I would like to confess to a most heinous misuse of someone else's ego. 
Many years ago, sometime in the late 80s, I was a fresh-faced police probationer in a semi-rural police station near Plymouth. My sergeant at the time was an old-timer who had, shall we say, certain views on how probationer constables should behave and what menial tasks they should perform. Now, being slightly older than the normal recruit, 20 years of age to be exact, I was opposed to some of the more mundane and pointless tasks I was called on to carry out. As a qualified engineer, I had used apprentices in the same way in my previous career. One of these tasks was what was commonly known as process. This basically meant I was required to persecute the poor old motorist with things like fines for not wearing seat belts and low tyre pressures, that kind of thing. I'm not saying this was not important, of course it was, but I was told to go out and look for process. It's good experience, it says in capital letters. This, however, was not the truth. It just gave the Sarge a bit of an ego trip when they held their monthly management meetings and he could smugly state how well his section were doing with the dreaded process. My tale takes place on Christmas Eve when I was working night shift. The Sarge was in an unusually good mood at the briefing as he handed out the keys to the cars and I, as usual, got the worst one. An old Ford Fiesta four-gear automatic which went about as fast as a roller skate. It was very embarrassing when you had your blue lights and horns on and ordinary motorists would drive past you with a smirk on their face. <laughs> Bye, you're not going to catch me in that, are you? The Sarge stated that tonight we were having an early meal break and everyone would be able, everyone would be eating together as he had a surprise for us all. I expected some fine Christmas fare and a present. As it turned out, we were presented with some sort of grotty rabbit pate, which he'd made at home. Nice. Once the meal break was over, I was called to the sergeant's office and told that as it was very, very quiet, I had to go out and look for some process. Well, to say I was crestfallen would be an understatement, as I knew the older officers were going to be upstairs in the club playing snooker. After all, it was Christmas Eve. I was issued with 20 fixed penalty notices and sticky bags with instructions that he expected me to get rid of them all tonight. I set off out of the station, moaning at the injustice of the police service and the fact that I was driving around in a really rubbish car when the new two-litre vehicles were all parked up together and not being used at all. By this time, it was ten past midnight and I found myself driving past the local church. Well, there seemed to be a lot of cars here tonight, I thought to myself. Then, of course, I remembered the date brilliant and that midnight mass was currently underway and a plan began to be hatched most of the cars were parked on double yellow lines i was desperate to get rid of my 20 fixed penalty notices uh, and not to upset poor old joe public which is a police term however i immediately began writing out tickets for every car i could find placing them in the sticky bags and sticking them to the windscreen of the said vehicles there were some passers-by who gave the odd remark about peace on earth and goodwill to all men <laughs> but frankly I didn't mind. I'd be able to show the Sarge the vehicles later on a drive-by with the sticky bags all on the windscreens, thus keeping him satisfied. True to form, the good old Sarge wanted to see proof of my excellent work. I took him to the area of the local church and pointed out the fixers, to which he responded, This is great. I would love to sit here and just watch as the churchgoers return to their vehicles, but I have a snooker game to attend. Due to my great work, I was permitted to finish an hour early that night and was the talk of the station for the next month or so. Some, po some people commented on how ruthless I was and that I would make a good traffic officer. I took it all in my stride and I gracefully accepted my newfound respect and even got to drive one of the new vehicles. However, you may have already judged me at this point, but you need to know this. I never actually left a filled-out parking ticket in any of the sticky bags. Not a single one. What I did was put a parking ticket with... Happy Christmas, written on each of the windscreens. So while the churchgoers would have been furious to start with, they would have laughed with holy joy when they saw my <laughs> message, wishing them the best for the festive season. So, Father Simon, I do not seek forgiveness for tricking the Sarge into thinking I had done all of that work, but I do ask forgiveness from the churchgoers, who would have been absolutely furious at the sight of the tickets on their cars after they came out from Midnight Mass, and for the way in which I so readily accepted the respect which came with my stunt. I'm now a sergeant myself, and have been for many years and I can honestly say I've never told a probationer constable to go out and get some process done because I've learnt my lesson yours most humbly Dick uh, well it's a nice little festive chin and he had us going for a while he thought what a vindictive chap but no he just wished everyone a happy Christmas what do you say Sister Rebecca process reminds me of um, what journalists <clears throat> used to have to do when they were starting out uh, I remember people at a news agency had to go and go to the underground and count trains for an entire day and come, down, come back and tell really? them how many trains there were Why? 
Well, just because they were trainees and that was just a way of being mean to them, you have to basically. Fill in the board and tick boxes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, I think uh, this is great. I mean, I'm amazed that uh, nobody found out later that he'd just written Happy Christmas on the tickets. But luckily. Well, no one's going to complain, are they? No, absolutely. I was outraged to find that I wasn't fined. But you would have thought that uh, perhaps his boss, the sergeant, didn't receive the fines that he was expecting and therefore found out. But clearly that didn't happen. And I think this was fantastic. I was about to tell you off and not forgive know, you, Dick. Sorry. But uh, you are completely forgiven. Well done. Everyone was all united. United in outrage, and then he took I was going to give you a proper Sally Traffic tongue lashing. <laughs> I really was on holy night to do that. But now I think you're some kind of saint. I think you're lovely. I think you're wonderful to have done that. It kind of pleased everybody except the sergeant who never found out. So it didn't really matter. So a happy Christmas to you. Well done. And uh, I think it was wonderful. You're totally forgiven. OK, nicely done. What do you think, Brother Matt? Uh, yeah, two things spring to mind. One, how does one laugh with holy joy? I'd, I'd love to see that. Oh. Ho, 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 and I'm uh, very saintly at the same time. And also, what uh, rabbit pate? What's that? That was the sergeant's special no. treat. <laughs> Nigel's never making rabbit pate. We need to get a promise from him on that. Well, I'm certainly never eating rabbit pate. Um, uh, obviously, we're going to forgive on this because all of us would have felt awful coming out and finding a parking ticket. But then to realise that it wasn't a parking ticket, just someone saying Merry Christmas and then laugh with holy joy. Uh, so I am definitely going to forgive. Well, here's a surprise. It's an extra Christmas podcast wow. DVD extra confession. <laughs> Not broadcast. It's an exclusive to this particular download. What's also extra special, well, Brother Matt's here as normal. Yes. Making his only appearance so far, Brother Alan. Yes, indeed. Brother. Old habits die hard. Then. Very good. Brother Deadly is here to sit in <laughs> on the collective for the very first. Are you an actually forgiving personality? Oh, all the time. Mainly myself, but generally, <laughs> generally other people. So it's a, uh, we're putting in here uh, as, a, as a download podcast special because it's a Christmas confession, so after this festive period, it's effectively dead. Sister Rebecca has just... Uh, are you going to make it in? To... I Sister... think she should. I think, I she, think should. she should. So even though the music is rolling, Sister Rebecca is just going to wander in with her shopping. Fortnum and Mason. <laughs> Fortnum and Mason again. <laughs> oh, certainly. Really. One anyway, day. Anyway, here we are, and Sister Rebecca just... Just in time, just in what time. Does it Take those brother headphones. Alan is, is new to our Forgiveness Collective. Welcome, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You're very welcoming. That's here's very kind. Here's our extra confessional podcast, then it comes from Stella. Are you ready, by the way? I am ready. Excellent. OK. OK. Dear Father Simon and the Christmas Collective, it is with much trepidation and a deep sense of guilt that I submit this confession for judgment by such an esteemed jury. Many years ago, not long before I was married, my fiancé came to spend Christmas Eve with me, my mother, my stepfather and a number of aged grandparents. Everyone was on very good form. Sherry had been dispensed, plus some other dubious-looking drinks from bottles that usually only saw the light of day at Christmas and a game of Scrabble was in full swing. Oh. The sprouts were bubbling merrily away in the kitchen. What a wonderful picture this is. <laughs> Under the stewardship of my stepfather, a man who was renowned within the family for his homemade brandy butter. No shop-bought product could ever darken the doors of his home, and with good reason. His ratio of brandy to butter was much higher, and the, elder, the elderly folk next door always remarked on how delicious it was. As a retired military man, he had spent the afternoon preparing the food and everything had been laid out in the kitchen with precision, ready for the evening ahead. Also present that night were the family's two dogs, Scrimp and Scrape, who were both known for their particular friendliness to humans at meal times. As my stepfather joined the rest of us to open a batch of presents before the meal, Scamp, rather unusually, was not in the room with his eyes on the peanuts. No one had really noticed until he suddenly appeared and leant his body nonchalantly against the doorframe with what appeared to be a huge grin on his face. I know that you're ahead of me, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> he then strolled across the room towards us and collapsed under the, <laughs> <laughs> under, under the Christmas tree, closing his eyes whilst his tongue hung out of his mouth. <laughs> Presents were momentarily forgotten as we sprang into action to check him over. Yes. The number of the vet was sought out, but just as my mother had begun to dial, the dog stood up, belched loudly and weaved, weaved his way out of the room, retreating to his basket in the kitchen, where he fell into a deep sleep, punctuated by the odd trip to the water bowl. We decided that we would continue with our evening plans, with me volunteering to keep an eye on him on a regular basis. Right. It was as I made one of my many visits to check on him that I noticed the bowl of brandy butter on the table nearby. I was puzzled. Despite the number of people at dinner, it looked as if my stepfather had not made as much as normal. Much more worryingly, the bowl was on its side... And the surface of the table around looked pretty greasy. I looked at Scamp. 
He belched again before continuing to snore. It was then I realised he wasn't ill. He was merely sleeping off the effects of having consumed something that was definitely not dog food. I had to think quickly. The anticipation for pudding and its accompanying butter amongst the elderly diners was building. The trouble was, most of it was now in the dog. There was nothing to do for it but to scoop up what was left into another bowl, smooth out the teeth marks, wipe wipe the saliva from the butter, (laughs) remove remove any straggly stringy bits and make it look as if it had always been there. Don't worry about clearing the table, I assured my mother and stepfather. You relax, I'll do it. Scurried backwards and forwards with the plates. As I approached the table with the butter for the pudding, my stepfather looked quizzically at the bowl. Luckily for me, he was in mid-conversation with a grandparent and couldn't question me about the change about the change of crockery the bowl was duly passed around the table with the aged folk pronouncing in turn that yet again my stepfather had excelled himself and that it was the most delicious brandy butter they'd ever tasted hmm. i did try very hard to make eye contact with my soon to be betrothed in an attempt to get him to decline the butter but looked quizzically he looked quizzically at my nods and winks continued to place a large dollop on his plate and tucked in like the rest around the table i knew that my efforts to warn him had been in vain i made my excuses and reached for the cream instead. What? Father oh. Simon, for any concern, listeners, I have to report there were no ill effects suffered by any of the humans present, and more importantly, the dog, who was back on top form by lunchtime on Christmas Day, sitting in his <laughs> usual place, looking hopefully for any food that might fall from the table. So I seek forgiveness for my deceit that night, in particular for not trying much harder at the time to prevent my husband to be from eating the butter that had already been licked by Scamp and contained some of his saliva. My only defence is that I was trying to prevent my stepfather from losing face. It's a a nice warming uh, tale, and the the drunk dogs... The tail was involved as well. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Scrimp and save. Two great... And that's not... We didn't change the names of the dogs. We changed the names of people. We don't change the names of dogs. I think that's reason. Brother Alan Dedicote, in with a collective. What do you say, Brother Alan? Well, straight away, you see, I would say... He was trying to also... He was trying to save disappointment from all those assembled people, and I think he achieved that. It's, I think it's, he achieved it's from Stella, so I imagine so, it's, yeah, it's a woman. Sorry, she, sorry, yes. yes, Stella, the lovely Stella. Oh, Stella, of course. Now you've mentioned it's not it. a reference to beer. So, uh, <laughs> not yet, anyway. But no, I, th- I, think, I think that was exactly the right thing to do. Disappointment was avoided, and no one was ill. That was the whole point. I was going to ask, was anyone ill? No, they everyone, weren't. Everyone was Got away with it, in. Stella, you got away with it. So that's forgiveness. Oh, it's absolutely forgiveness, yes. Sister Rebecca. I think that if Stella really thought that it wasn't going to be dangerous for the uh, older people around the table and for her betrothed. I know she tried to warn her betrothed, but uh, it didn't work. I think she should have had some of the brandy butter herself. I think it was a little bit hypocritical, actually. Um, In fact, I think if she wasn't going to have it, I think she should have just said, look, the dog's been at the brandy butter. Let's not eat it. I mean, the stepfather wouldn't have lost face. Have a bit of cream instead. So I think, Stella, you're not forgiven. Oh, it's it's down to the wire with Brother Matthew. Is is this what happens then when dogs get drunk, is that they wander (laughs) in and collapse under the Christmas tree? <laughs> and then belch and then go off to the water bowl and then come back with a big smile on the face. Um, I, I also think it's uh, hilarious that uh, she decided, not A, not to tell anyone else that the dog had been at the brandy butter, but then say, do you know what, I think I'll have the cream. I'll have the cream. I know I always have the brandy butter, but tonight I'm having the cream. I, I, I'm absolutely superb. And for that, Stella, you're definitely forgiven. Uh, so that is, forg- on balance, that's uh, forgiveness for Stella. Yes, thank, yes, you, thank you very much, Uh, So that's it, and that's the end of this uh, Christmas special uh, collection of podcasts. Confessions will be back in the new year. Yes, it will. Which is will very... Alan Dedicote be back in the well, new thank year? thank you for asking. You're yes, very, exactly. very welcome. Uh, you're any very t- kind. You're any very time. Kind. You can fight it out with uh, Mother Superior. Yes, I'm very forgiving. I'm very forgiving. <laughs> uh, but send your confessions for the new year, please. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. If you have a, 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 a specific New Year's Evil or New Year confessions, we'd like to hear those. Go via the website, bbc.co.uk slash radio 2. Go to the Drive Time pages. You can confess from there. Thanks for listening to this BBC Radio 2 free download. Now, why not try more? Jazz for me, I guess, is improvisation. My pick of the best in rhythm and blues. Music from Richard Thompson, Chris Wood and Pentangle, amongst many, many others. All at the BBC Radio 2 website.